You are listening to the Wool Academy podcast. This is episode number three. Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth Van Delden and once a week we talk to an industry expert from the wool industry supply chain from farm to fashion and beyond, delivering strategies and insights to be successful in wool and showcasing those beautiful stories wool has to tell. Today's episode is supported by The Wool Room. The Wool Room is dedicated to delivering you a better night's sleep. At thewoolroom.com you can choose from a wide range of mattresses, mattress protectors, bedding and beds filled with British wool, ensuring that you stay cool and comfortable at night. Find out how wool can improve your sleep by visiting thewoolroom.com and claim your 10% discount with the promo code WOOLACADEMY. Without further ado, let's get started with today's guest. We are happy to welcome Tune Skada Tobiasen. Tune lives in Norway and she is a journalist and editor and author of several books. But I think everyone who knows Tune would describe her as a true wool ambassador and advocate for sustainable fashion. Tune, welcome. It is so great to have you on our show today. Thank you for inviting me. Wonderful. Thanks for your time. And why don't you get us started by giving our audience a little bit more information about yourself and your work? Well, as you said, I'm a, basically a journalist, but um, I used to be in the fashion uh, industry, uh, working for a fashion magazine, uh, but then I decided to do something uh, more meaningful with my life, so I started to work with uh, sustainable uh, issues surrounding uh, specifically textiles and fashion, and um, slowly but surely got more involved in, uh, in projects. Uh, relating to this research projects uh, and uh, then uh, that has led to lectures and uh, books and other types of, uh, of communication forms. Okay, and what was it that made you fall in love with wool? Well, um, I think it was, uh, I think most Norwegians actually, uh, even though they don't, don't maybe think about it that much uh, are wool lovers because it's it's so much in the DNA of, of, of us but um, I think it's specifically developed um, uh, because of the uh, uh, what I think is is <laughs> it is one of the most sustainable uh, uh, fibers out there uh, but also just uh, how one can can wear it uh, in all types of setting and um, uh, and uh, just knowing about the, the quality and the passion behind it, the people who are actually uh, from the, the wool producers and all the way through to the designers. And I think it's, it's, it's uh, one of the fibers that once you, you start to understand it, you start to understand the technical qualities and what it can actually do, which is more or less a miracle, uh, then you just can't stop loving it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you uh, you said that wool is so important in the or like part of the Norwegian DNA. Can you go a little bit more deeper? Like I know that like it's also already with children you have to clothe the Norwegian children in wool. Can you explain that a little bit more? <laughs> yeah, we we generally say that uh, you're a bad parent uh, in Norway if you don't dress your uh, kids in wool. Uh, and in the kindergartens, they um, all the parents generally get a letter home with them at the start of the uh, uh, the the fall season, where they're told that um, the kids have to wear wool underwear, um, uh, and that has several <laughs> practical aspects because um, for the the um, uh, kindergarten kids, they're outside a lot in, in Norway, so they they don't play it only indoors uh, so they have to be dressed for all, all the different seasons uh, and they'll just pull on a what they call a park uh, suit on, on the outside uh, and they'll be outside with, with a nice uh, warm wool uh, on the inside and if they get wet or sweaty or anything then of course the temperature temperature is regulated uh, and they don't feel clammy or cold or, or wet or anything Uh, and then once they, they come inside, they just take off the, the pork uh, suit and then um, they jump around in their wool underwear, which are generally long johns or, and uh, long-sleeved um, tops. Uh, and they 
um, consider themselves fully dressed, even though uh, somebody coming from another country would look at them and say, hey, they're wearing uh, thermal underwear. Uh, what is this? You know, they're not really fully dressed, but, but they will uh, consider themselves as fully dressed, which is, of course, what's important. But, uh, um, and this was, uh, this was a change that actually happened um, uh, that I remember because when my kids were in kindergarten, they did not have this woolen uh, underwear. Uh, they generally wore fleece or they wore, uh, uh, you know, polyester uh, super underwear. And, uh, uh, but in the uh, uh, 90s, we had a, a Norwegian skier who uh, launched his own line and he was very popular. Uh, and he really made it popular for both grown-ups and kids to wear this thermal uh, wool underwear uh, when they were skiing, uh, outdoors, uh, during, yeah, especially during fall and, and uh, winter season. Uh, and then it, it uh, slowly but surely became uh, the way that kids were dressing in the kindergarten. And now we see that even the grown-ups are adopting this uh, more and more. Uh, for sports, um, but also um, it's slowly but surely also creeping into the more leisure uh, wear, uh, and uh, and that's you know just because people feel really really comfortable in it. And uh, I was talking to a mom uh, who's a friend of mine the other day, and and um, uh, she was saying that you know. I really noticed that if I forget uh, uh, to dress my kids in in the wool underwear, they get sick immediately. You know, if I if I by mistake dress them in some, something in cotton, uh, a couple of days later they're sick. Hmm, yeah. No, it, it, I find it really fascinating how Norwegians uh, use wool in their everyday life, and I think it's important that the rest of the wool industry really better understands th this culture to see how other countries can adapt these traditions as well. But speaking of uh, Norway and wool, you also have a new project that you call Cruise, if I say it correctly. Can yes. you talk a little bit about that project? Mm, yeah, Cruise, uh, spelled K-R-U-S, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mean uh, is the Norwegian word for crimp. Uh, and Norwegian wool has exceptional crimp, uh, which is why it's used a lot in, in carpets, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Um, but um, um, this specific uh, project that is led by the um, Consumer Research Institute, CIFO, um, is actually uh, to enhance the local value chains for Norwegian wool. And it's a project from the Research Council in Norway. Uh, and it's a huge, huge project, several um, million um, euros. Uh, and it um, um, looks at um, different types of uh, approaches to, to uh, the local wool. Um, uh, but it's under uh, a, a, a specific part of the, the Research Council work, which is with bio-based uh, products. So it was uh, that we actually got this project is, is more or less a miracle because it was in competition with all bio-based uh, industries. And everybody, you know, is super, uh, uh, we're moving towards this bio-based um, uh, society. And so everybody wants to get into this area. So it was actually a miracle that we got it. But um, uh, it looks at um, uh, a lot of different aspects. Uh, one thing is this uh, uh, transparency and uh, origin, for example, uh, about labeling of a wool, like one has ice wool in Iceland and one has Swiss wool in Switzerland and British wool, uh, and how this, this could work in Norway, because, uh, for example, the uh, traditional Norwegian sweaters um, can or, or or at least some of the brands um, have Norwegian wool in them, but others don't. They use imported wool and this is not signaled in any uh, good way, so there, there is no labeling uh, today. Uh, so we're looking at uh, how could this, uh, this be in the future. 
and is there a need for labeling, etc., uh, etc. Et but we're also looking at some local sheep breeds that have um, specific problems uh, attached to uh, their wool. It can be that um, the quality of the wool has deteriorated over the last years. It can be that it's pigmented so that the industry doesn't really uh, like it. Uh, and that type of thing. So we had three different types of, of, of breed, local breeds that we're working with. Uh, we're also looking at um, uh, new business models because um, um, business as usual is uh, disappearing in the fashion and textile industry um, more uh, to a large degree because of this fast fashion that has undermined uh, the system completely. Uh, so we're looking at uh, new business models that can be interesting for uh, companies. And we're also looking at um, uh, the whole concept of slow fashion, uh, local fashion. Uh, uh, and this is a work uh, a package that uh, we're doing together with Kate Fletcher in the UK. And she works a lot with, with this um, these types of things. And um, so this is going to be a, a, an area where totally new uh, research is going to surface. Uh, and then, of course, we have the dissemination package, which I generally then lead for different projects. Okay, wow, that really sounds like a big project. And is it also, did I understand correctly, is it also about how can more manufacturing be again done in Norway? and not abroad? Is that also part of the concept? Uh, yes, it's part of the looking at the new business models because there is this um, reshoring or onshoring or uh, uh, this whole thing about made in Italy, made in uh, UK, uh, manufacture New York. The, there are all these things happening now internationally where we're seeing the sort of return to more local production. Uh, in the same way that uh, there's been um, uh, the whole slow food movement, which is based on local produce, uh, which is in season, etc., etc., um, uh, there is a movement uh, globally in this direction too, because people um, want to feel connected again with with the products. They want they want uh, um, some sense of. Uh, uh, where things come actually come from, where they're produced, um, uh, provenance, etc. It's becoming more and more important. And um, uh, luckily for Norway, we still have some um, spinning mills and we have uh, both uh, knitting factories and um, uh, weaving mills still here. Uh, so uh, now uh, we are working closer and closer together, um, trying to... Uh, reconnect uh, the value chain so that um, peop um, these companies that haven't really worked together uh, very efficiently over the last uh, 30, 40 years uh, are now uh, coming together and trying to find new ways to cooperate. And so actually Thursday this week we're, we we're having a meeting with uh, some of the, the actors from spinner spinner uh, spinning mills and also from um, uh, one of the small uh, weaving factories on the northwest coast because there's a big uh, Oslo design fair and a lot of the the people will be actually in uh, the Oslo region for that so uh, uh, we're going to sit down and discuss you know what type of, of new uh, products and um, uh, cooperations can uh, be activated yeah, and do you also think this is like a general trend also that the wool industry can tap into and also maybe for upcoming designers and entrepreneurs something to look at? Yes, and I think it, it's uh, partially uh, driven by technology and the technological development that's uh, ongoing in, the, for example, knitting machines that are... Uh, ex getting extremely advanced, uh, but also simpler to use. And we were talking to the one of the guys who imports uh, Shima Saiki machines to Norway, uh, and he was explaining that you know uh, it, only a few years ago you really had to be a uh, engineer, uh, tech, you know, tech 
technically very competent to run these machines and to program them, but it's becoming simpler and simpler. Uh, so now the machine will tell you if you're trying to do something uh, that it actually can't do. So um, uh, it, uh, I think we'll come to maybe to the level where if several designers uh, cooperate, they can they can um, maybe buy uh, um, a knitting machine, uh, a whole garment machine, and actually have the production in in their own uh, studio. Uh, uh, and um, so it is very technologically driven um, and um, uh, I, that will change things drastically in the next decade I'm sure mm. No I agree and I think it's a huge opportunity for innovation and yeah for a small niche fiber like wool um, also Yeah and it also means you can, you can uh, have smaller runs uh, and you can uh, make sure that you know the things actually fit the the consumer, uh, so that you're not so reliant on you know mass production, uh, large volumes. That uh, because the price will be it will be easier to keep the prices down. Yeah, exactly. And earlier you also mentioned that um, things like provenance are becoming more and more important, and that consumers want to know more about how their products are made but at the same time like I was talking to Leslie Pryor this morning and she said she sometimes gets questions like do your sheep actually also sleep and <laughs> there's a huge and someone else was telling me that their taxi driver didn't know that lamb came from sheep so there seems to be a real disconnect between the consumer and their understanding of how their products are being made Why do you think? Uh, yeah, that's, that's I think okay. there's a huge knowledge gap uh, out there, and and that's part of what really needs to be addressed. Because um, uh, I was talking to the CEO at uh, Uliana, which is a Norwegian iconic knit factory, and uh, Signa, who's uh, who owns the factory, uh, was uh, she? Um, it's on on the west coast, outside of Bergen. And it's now part of the Econo Musée system, so one can actually visit the the uh, factory and and see how things are produced there. Uh, and um, she uh, generally often invites in um, uh, school classes. So when they're at um, secondary level, uh, the the class comes into the factory and they are show, you know before they're shown around. She she asks uh, all this all the um, school kids, oh, what are you wearing? And they go, uh, jeans, a uh, t-shirt. And she goes, no, 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 that's not what I was asking. I was asking what type of, of fiber are you wearing? Are you asking, uh, are you wearing um, cotton? Are you wearing wool? Are you wearing uh, polyester? And they all look at her and like, big question marks. It's like, how would we know? <laughs> and she tells them, well, they then read on the label because it will tell you that your jeans are made from cotton, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And everybody you know, starts pulling off their clothes to look at the labels to see what they're actually <laughs> wearing. Uh, and then she asks, well, uh, uh, what you, uh, your jeans, are they knit or are they woven? And everybody will be like big question marks. They have no idea what the difference between knit and, and woven is. And so she, then she'll explain the difference. And then she'll show them around the factory. And of course, then they, their eyes are huge like because uh, they're actually understanding the processes behind this and um, uh, but it goes to show you know that that uh, most young people have absolutely no idea they think uh, clothes magically appear out of some machine they don't know that uh, that there's a lot of handwork involved and a lot of um, uh, uh, artisan uh, knowledge uh, so uh, I think more or less uh, Every uh, child, when you know they're old enough to understand these processes, should go visit the factory. Um, no, that, that sounds like a really good educational program that your mm. colleague is doing there. And I know also that you do or you are, did a lot of research, also um, better understanding the consumers. And what did you learn were like the main barriers for consumers in regards to wool, and how can we address that? Well, we, we have compared, for example, Norway and, and Sweden on this account because Swedes are not big wool users. And that's a big mystery because, of course, they have the same climate as we do. So one would think that they would uh, be uh, wool users too. 
uh, but they aren't. They use uh, synthetic uh, underwear uh, also during winter because it, um, th their whole idea is that it, tr it transports um, out the, the, um, uh, the sweat. And, and, uh, and, uh, and so that's why they use the, the synthetics. Um, but the understanding that actually uh, wool, when it gets wet, it doesn't feel wet at all, so it doesn't matter uh, that it gets sweaty. Uh, but also um, uh, the fact that it doesn't smell the way the synthetics do uh, is, is becoming more and more important for the consumer. And the understanding that the wool is temperature regulating, I think, is, is very, very hard to get across because uh, I, I talked to um, several people about this and you, when you start explaining why wool is temperature regulating, they go, I hear what you say, but I don't believe you <laughs> because it's so associated with being something that keeps you warm uh, and not something that can also cool you down. Uh, but, um, so I think, you know, to really, really, uh, people really have to try it out, um, uh, uh, themselves to, uh, to understand how it works. And, uh, uh, I, I guess I became completely convinced that, uh, it's true when I, I was in New York for actually for the IWTO, uh, Congress there, and I had bought a t-shirt at Icebreaker and it was 30 some degrees outside. And I wore it uh, on my last day when I was going back home to Norway, and uh, it was ugh, it was so humid and it was so warm, and I was lugging around my daughter's luggage and I was uh, swearing and um, just so, yeah, it was a terrible day. But you know, I felt comfortable wearing this uh, t-shirt, uh, and I sweated and everything was fine because I didn't really get uh, overheated. And then I came out to the airport and um, I checked in my uh, my daughter's luggage and I had my own carry-on and there I had of course the the jacket I was going to put on once I boarded the plane which are planes are generally ice cold um, and um, but uh, I was told that I could also check in that luggage so I sent the, that luggage off and then oh shoot there went my jacket mm -hmm. so I was still only wearing this wool t-shirt uh, but I came on board the, the plane and it was, uh, as usual, freezing cold, but I was still comfortable. So I'd gone from 30 some degrees and then in, into the cold airplane wearing the same t-shirt and no matter what, I was comfortable. Yeah, that's the wonderful properties of wool as we know them. Yeah. Yeah. And in, 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 uh, you know, if you talk to people who live in very, very warm climates, so, you know, we've been in, in Dubai, for example, they say, no, we can't use wool. We can't use wool. We have to use cotton. And it's like, well, you're going in and out of air conditioned the shopping centers and into the, you know, the heat. Uh, and uh, if you're wearing cotton, you're going to get sick going between those extremes. But if you wear the thin wool, you know, you'll be perfectly fine in both settings. Mm. So the barrier is really the, the learned perception of what fibers do. And yeah. you need to show them actively. Yeah. So, uh, so I think, you know, uh, that's... Uh, I think in many ways, probably YouTube is, is the best way to, to get that type of message across so in an effective way. And I've seen that... Uh, Woolmark has made a, a nice cartoon uh, explaining uh, some of this, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, there just needs to be more ways of, of different ways of explaining it to, to people. So that, um, uh, but one also needs to have the the products available uh, so that one can actually uh, get hold of them. And when we were in Sweden and talking to the consumers there about you know next to skin wool and. Um, we talked to people who were uh, had become they'd become wool lovers and they were more or less f almost fanatical about it. Um, uh, they were like, "Oh, where can we get these products? Where can we get this wool bra? Where where can we get this wool you know thin um, uh, T-shirt?" And so we had to give them a whole list of where, where you know the different companies that actually sell these. Because it's it's not easy to find, and in Sweden, uh, you know, we walked into some children's clothing stores and asked, oh, "Do you have anything in wool?" And uh, for the most part, they looked at us like we were crazy. 
but um, actually, uh, you know, some of the stores did have some uh, some wool clothing, and um, um, but it, you know, not huge amounts of it. It's 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 a lot of cotton out. There's a lot of cotton out there for the for the, in children's clothing. Hmm. Yeah, and then it's probably also not uh, clearly identified that these garments are made out of wool. Nope. So it, people it might just look at the price tag and find it very expensive, not yes. understanding the benefits of yeah. the product itself. So then you need, of course, the, the, the people in the store, the ones who are uh, meeting the consumers to have this understanding too, so that they can explain, you know, why there's a difference in, in price that goes to the quality and that goes to, to the the properties of the, of the fiber and that it's well worth the price. Yeah, exactly. And you just mentioned also, um, you know, educational videos on YouTube. And I also noticed that you are very active on social media. So tell me a little bit how you're using social media to get the different messages about wool out there. Uh, well, I use, uh, I'm, I'm uh, quite active on Twitter and uh, Instagram and on Facebook. Uh, and on Facebook, of course, I have different uh, groups and pages that I, I post things uh, on uh, related to both the, the Cruz project, but also to the NICE project, the Nordic Initiative Clean and Ethical. Uh, and there we have um, both a page and, um, uh, and a group. Um, and so every time there's, you know, something, uh, related to, um, sustainable issues when it comes to wool, then I post it, uh, on there, but if it goes more to local, uh, local concerns, uh, regarding wool, then I post it on the cruise, um, uh, in the cruise group, uh, but we also have a campaign for wool, um, page, uh, on Facebook for the Norwegian campaign for wool, so sometimes I post things there uh, so it's you know all the time being active uh, making sure that links to to interesting articles or reports are are put out there on twitter and then making sure that um, i also tag the relevant people uh, be it uh, um, organizations that i know or uh, people that i know agree and that they'll spread it in their network or it might be somebody I know um, that uh, completely disagrees and uh, but I'll, I'll still tag them so they have to read the article <laughs> <laughs> uh, and on Instagram I have started my own uh, crusade for uh, wearing wool mm -hmm. so um, uh, if I'm uh, going to the gym and I'm wearing wool I, I might post a picture of uh, my wool gym clothes or this weekend um, uh, I was in the mountains with my husband's family so uh, I posted a few pictures on Instagram about wearing wool there uh, and also during Oslo runway uh, I wore wool um, on, the, on the two days and I made sure to, to post pictures of myself wearing the wool dress or the wool skirt um, and then I'll, of course, also make sure that the, uh, the brand uh, gets um, tagged so that they, again, you know, can like it or they can re retweet or re-Instagram or whatever it's called when you s mm -hmm. repeat something on Instagram. Um, and uh, no, so um, uh, I just try to keep the noise level up. <laughs> yeah, and what do you think... Um How should the wool industry um, approach social media and how can they take more advantage of the different social media channels? Uh, well, I think that, um, uh, for example, uh, Instagram, uh, just all the time telling, you know, cute little stories or have nice pictures of sheep. Um, I took some pictures of sheep this uh, weekend too and posted that. Um, Uh, is uh, is very important and it's you know Instagram is all about nice pictures so nice pictures of sheep nice pictures of the wool clothing uh, how the wool clothing is used used and, uh, I, I noticed that um, uh, some of the companies are, are good at that uh, and um, uh, but you know the uh, 
at all levels of the industry. For example, the, even the we, weaving uh, companies, uh, knit companies, can they can put out a lot of really nice stuff. I noticed that the the, the Scottish weaving mills are really good at uh, using uh, uh, at least Twitter. They're super good. Uh, and Twitter is partially about nice pictures, but it's also about uh, getting out the links to to um, articles, um, uh, uh, different sites, whatever, uh, because there, of course, you have so limited um, number of, of uh, uh, letters that you can actually put out in the Twitter message. Uh, but you can also, of course, add a picture, which will tell some extra st um, stories. Uh, and um, but Twitter is is, is um, uh, at least I follow uh, so many that uh, I miss a lot of the stuff that's put out there, uh, and I don't have time to you know follow it all the time. On Instagram, I think people have generally maybe fewer followers and follow fewer, so it's easier to to uh, come through and actually get attention. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Um, uh, Twitter, of course, uh, people are, there are good at spreading things too. If they see something they like, they'll retweet. Uh, and uh, but I think it's also working between the platforms. So if you if you put out something nice on Instagram, then you can also um, put it out on on Facebook, uh, so that you you interconnect all the time between the different uh, platforms. Uh, but um, uh, it's again, you know, it's it's all about noise level and uh, probably repeating things over and over and over again, but in, in different ways because uh, it, it's um, it's going to be a it's going to be a haul, uh, maybe a long haul, but um, people will, in uh, I think, finally understand because now people are starting to talk about this uh, that they're sick of of just stuff. They're sick of. Um, fast fashion, they're sick of this, uh, um, this, uh, what we, what, well, I sort of have named it DDT, the modern DDT, which is designed destined for trash. <laughs> uh, and uh, people's closets are full of stuff they don't use. Um, they're starting to realize that maybe we should downscale, we should downsize, we should go back to. Uh, other values that are about quality, that are about uh, feeling good about what you're wearing, not just buying, just to buy. Uh, and um, uh, there's this whole reaction thing going on. And once the reaction starts, um, things can change very quickly. Uh, and I think it's important for to, for wool to position mm, itself as a fiber that is part of this change and is part of this um, um, change in attitude uh, that we should take better care of the things we have uh, that we uh, should think about our clothing as something valuable as something that we love uh, and you never hear anybody say I love my synthetic fleece jacket never heard anybody say that but you'll hear people say they love their old wool sweater or they love this and that and and often it will be a wool jacket or it'll be something that they really really are passionate about but uh i have yet to hear somebody say oh i really love my fleece jacket <laughs> Yes, that's probably true. But also what you were just talking about, um, Twitter and also fast fashion and kind of the contra movement towards slow fashion. I, one interesting example that you're very closely connected to is uh, Livia Firth, who, who is also a very strong advocate f against fast fashion. And she started this campaign on Twitter called 30 Wears. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, well, um, it started, uh, we talked a lot, um, a lot of times, but she's been, um, uh, uh, I, yeah, actually I, st I first started, uh, talking a little bit to her when, when, uh, she was a guest at the first campaign for wool launch in London. I wasn't there physically, but she had worked with some, uh, uh Norwegian designers, uh, among others, uh, Nina Skada, who's worked a lot with wool. Uh, and so um, uh, I ended up uh, meeting her in New York when Nina Skada had her launch there. 
which was at the same time as the IWTO Congress was there. She was a guest there, and we ended up, uh, and it was Crown Princess of Norway was there, and um, uh, Livia is also a friend of the Crown Princess of Norway. Uh, and um, we uh, ended up talking and uh, hit it off, and since then, you know, we've, we've been in contact a lot, and, uh, and she also was a speaker at the Copenhagen Fashion Summit uh, two years ago, uh, and then again this spring. Uh, and um, her uh, initial sort of take on sustainable fashion was, of course, um, uh, looking at, uh, she works with a, with a company called Eco Age, uh, which is a consultancy, and she has had this green carpet challenge with Vogue. Uh, and her initial um, approach was a lot about, you know, doing things in the right way, working with um, uh, designers who uh, had a a sustainable approach uh, but she has uh, after we've had some discussions also um, uh, and talking about this you know well uh, you're on the green carpet wearing something new every time is what's the point of that because then you're actually adding to, to the problem what about wearing things uh, better and, and, and more and actually uh, wearing them over again several times and, and she is um, uh, become an advocate of, of that very much and uh, uh, now she uh, uh, will post things on Instagram and on Twitter where it's like hashtag 30 wears and it will be maybe something she's inherited from her mother or something she has herself owned for a long time and she will tell the story behind that and I uh, and again I think it's it's something that's important because um, it's, it's about how we talk about our clothes because it the, the uh, fashion industry and the fashion press has been very about, much about, yeah, the new seasons must have, you have to, you know, this season you have to buy this, that, and uh, whatever. And, and fashion actually, it doesn't change. It's, it's, um, it's the biggest lie out there. Uh, fashion is, is um, always, uh, of course, in motion because the people want to sell different things, but the same trends that are uh, each fall uh, you can find them uh, over and over and over again. And having been an editor in a fashion magazine, I know this because we'd always just, you know, oh shit, we can't use it uh, that this uh, this season because we used it last season. But it'll still be out there. It'll still still be a trend. Um, so things are actually the same all the time. But um, they haven't changed since maybe the nineteen eighties or something. 1980s, 1990s. After that, everything is, is just recycled as, as the same trends over and over again. Um, and so um, uh, uh, she's been very good at, at changing the way one, one talks about things. And that's what's important is, is how we talk about our clothes, not as something new, but as something that we like and that we feel that we look good in. Uh, not because it's new, but it, it could be because it, it's old and that we wear it over and over again. And then, uh, so we need the conversation about our clothes also to change. Yeah, no, I agree in that. Um, it's great that you and also Livia are doing that. And what would you maybe recommend to young designers or entrepreneurs who are looking at wool and starting their business? How can they incorporate these kind of thoughts into their business? Well, I think it, it needs to be, you know, most designers when um, when they come with a, when they have a collection, uh, they can um, they can talk about it in this way, you know, they can talk about the materials they use and why they use those materials uh, and uh, that uh, they want, uh, they want something to last, they want it to be something that uh, one can build a wardrobe around. Uh, not something that uh, is just a seasonal item that uh, will be, you know, uh, ready to throw out after uh, the three or four months. Um, if if that's their their aim, that you know, people should buy over and over again new stuff. Then they should work with something that is, of course, uh, biodegradable, which will in the long run, or also is, but. Um, uh, um, 
that shouldn't be the aim of why they're creating clothes because why why would you want to do that as a designer most designers don't want that they don't want to sell something to the consumer that the consumer will feel is old or dated after a short while uh that that's uh i'm sure that would you know be fairly sad for most designers to think that oh i'm i'm just giving them something that uh that will have a very short life so i um, uh, in all sorts of communication with their customers they they should you know also tell the, the customer how to best take care of uh, the clothing um, because with wool, of course, um, um, there is a problem with moths, uh, which um, the consumer needs to learn how to handle uh, and um, about how to care for it with, with the laundering. That um, wool can actually be machine washed uh, and should be spin, spun uh, at the you know, end of the wash cycle with a high speed so you get the, the water out of the the products because it's in the water that the dirt is uh, and that you can you don't have to dry uh, um, the wool items flat that's old-fashioned uh, and as long as you get the, the water spun out of it then it, it can hang and dry anyway and that you do, actually don't need to launder it all that often that you can just air it and uh, it'll be just fine again <laughs> And what's your term you earlier mentioned? Uh, design destined for trash, trash DDT, yeah. and what's then the contrary to that? What designers should aim for? And that's wonderful to wear. We call it W two W. Wonderful. <laughs> <to wear>. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Well, very creative. Thank you for sharing that. Well, before we close, where can w before we close the session, where can our audience get in contact with you or find out more about you and your work? Well, on, uh, generally they can uh, check out nicefashion.org, uh, which will automatically bring you over to nordicfashionassociation.com, but uh, I, I sort of steer all the nicefashion.org uh, um, pages, uh, and there we post a lot of news on what's happening, and Cruz also has um, an area there, uh, as well as the other wool projects that we've done, including... Uh, Uh, Viking Gold, uh, which was a project with uh, old sheep breeds in Norway um, and the Viking heritage. Uh, but then, of course, uh, uh, Instagram, Tuna Tobison, and um, also Twitter. Uh, so, um, and generally, um, I try to make such a nuisance of myself that most people will have a hard time not finding me. <laughs> okay, and we'll also link to our your different websites and social media accounts in our show notes so that people can find you very easily. Well, thank you so much, Tuna, for your yep. time. It was very interesting to talk to you. And I appreciate that you shared all your different insights with us. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure you access all the additional information about today's show by going to our website. Visit elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 003. That is elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 003. If you liked today's show, may we recommend that you subscribe to our podcast so that you don't miss any of our next episodes and also do us a favor and tell your colleagues and friends about us. That would mean the world to us and thank you and see you next week. Bye-bye.